Hello, listeners. We are back here on Healthcare Experience Matters, and I'm super excited for today's episode. We're talking with Dr. Matthew Whitaker. He's recently joined the faculty coaching team here at the Healthcare Experience Foundation, and he's also Chief Executive Officer of Diamond Strategies, LLC. He's an author, a Cornell University certified DEI executive, a community outreach specialist, as well as an interest-based resolution practitioner. Dr. Whitaker, thank you for joining our show today. And I'll just have you introduce yourself for our listeners and tell us a little bit more about your professional background. Sure. Sounds great. Number one, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to join with you. Uh, Matthew Whitaker, again, founder and CEO of Diamond Strategies. I am a historian by training. So um, one of my undergraduate degrees, I have two. One is in history, the other is in sociology. I have a master's degree in history, U.S. history, and a Ph.D. in U.S. history with an emphasis on um, comparative Black history, civil rights, right, and the intersection of race, class, gender, and sexual orientation in American history. So I approach and come to this work, DEI, DEIB, JEDI, Debbie whatever acronym you want to use from a social scientist uh, background. Um, I do not have an HR background, although several of my team members, staff members do. And uh, being a historian gives me a unique perspective on this work. I'm an Arizona native. I'm a Westerner. And um, I, one of the things that I write about also is the uniqueness of regions in American history. As you just mentioned, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So for our listeners that might not be familiar, let's just start with you defining that for us. Sure, and I'll do so by defining each letter in the acronym first. So justice really is fairness plus restoration, right? So the J in Jedi is justice, um, and that justice really is, as I said, um, fairness plus restoration, meaning establishing fair and equitable policies and practices, but also taking into account that the absence of those equitable policies and practices have left certain employees, certain clients, certain patients that we serve left behind and underserved, which has affected their experience. It's expected their, it's, it's affected their health. It's affected lots of different things. And so restoration means how do we make them whole? The E is for equity, which simply means giving people what they need to be successful rather than what you want them to have, right? It's different than equality because we've been on equality paradigm for the better part of 151 years. Right. Given all of this, the civil rights movement, all of the protest movements, social justice movements, we have been looking for and at equality before the law. Equity basically says that um, giving everybody the same thing isn't necessarily going to move the needle. A perfect example is the American with Disabilities Act. Right. Um, that basically says, listen, there are certain things that you have to have in place within your establishment in order to make access equitable for folks with disabilities. That could be an elevator. It could be Braille inside the elevator, whatever the case may be. It could be larger screens for workers within um, the building so that they can see if they have they're visually impaired. Right. So that's equity. I don't need an elevator. Some brothers and sisters and folks that are disabled need an elevator. That is equity. Another way of looking at it is triage. So picture yourself on a battlefield and you're observing and there's one tent and there's two healthcare providers. I'm sorry, one healthcare provider and two people are brought into the tent. One is hemorrhaging from the neck and the other one has a broken toe. That one healthcare provider has to determine who they're going to serve. Who do they serve first? Most people would say the person hemorrhaging from the neck. You don't want them to bleed out and die. It doesn't mean that broken toes aren't painful. I often say all toes matter, but we have to focus on the person who needs the triage first. That really is equity. We just have a hard, hard, hard time understanding it at home and from a social standpoint. And the D is really easy. That's diversity. It's a fact. It's just who's in the room, right? Um, the challenge for us are certain aspects of diversity that we have a challenge with, particularly race, sexual orientation, 
and gender are the big bull elephants at the intersection of social justice and equity. And then the I is just a inclusion. And inclusion is making diversity work, right? Just because you're sitting at the table doesn't mean you're being fed. And inclusion means you're being fed. Just because you're sitting at the table or you're in the room doesn't mean that people are soliciting your opinion. And it doesn't mean that you're being fed what you need to remain healthy. That would be equity again. Preparing a meal that takes into account a shellfish allergy, whether you're vegan, you know, vegetarian, whether you have where you're lactose intolerant. You could say, hey, that's a lot of work for the chef. Yeah, but you don't want people getting sick. So you want to give people what they need. That's Jedi. And I hope that that's concise. Um, but the J, E, D, and I, and then together. And the key to moving the needle in this area is understanding what each one of those letters means individually and what they mean together. Well, that was really well said. I really appreciate all the metaphors that you use. It helps it all make sense to me. So you are an established expert in this field and you've devoted your professional work to advancing justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I wanna know what your why is. What restores your purpose every single day? What restores my purpose? I have a profound and abiding love and fascination with humanity. Um, I I love people. I don't always like people, uh, but I love folks, right? You love your family. You don't always like everyone in your family. Uh, but but you love them. And I want to see us be the best that we can be. And I know that sounds cliche, almost like some sort of a, uh, you know, corny aphorism. But that's I'm sincere in that. I believe that we're going to get past this sort of developmental adolescence that we are in as a species that seems very painful right now. But in order to do that, we have to learn more about each other and we have to learn how to leverage leverage difference for cohesion, productivity, health and wellness. And once we do that, we will move to the next stage, I believe, in our development. We have to get there first. And and, and here's the thing. I think a lot of people struggle with issues that are rooted in the social and the personal and the ways in which the extent to which they're connected to the professional and, and, and in the workplace. For so long, we've tried to separate those. We've tried to check our personal at the door. At least those in power have said, check your personal at the door. As we have become more diverse as a society and our organizations are more diverse and the people that we serve are more diverse, we are finding out that people bring with them the essence of who they are, the way that they see the world, the lenses through which they they see it, and the trauma and the joy with them wherever they go. And the best institutions moving forward in our development, those that are going to be the most successful are those who understand that and harness it and don't dismiss it as some feel good, touchy feely type of thing, but a real business imperative, a real institutional imperative that's going to maximize our potential to serve and to produce. As I mentioned in the beginning of this interview, Dr. Whitaker has recently joined the faculty coaching team here at Healthcare Experience Foundation. And I'm just curious, what drew you to wanting to collaborate with the Healthcare Experience Foundation? Something very interesting. I have done a lot of work in the area of health uh, disparities for years, in part because I am in a family within which a number of people have lost their lives because of diseases and ailments that disproportionately affect uh, Black people, BIPOC folks, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, women, poor folks, right? And, um, and, And urban and rural folks who have come of age in close proximity to landfills, things of that nature that affect our health. I had uh, two aunts that died of sickle cell. And so I had a fundamental, I've always had a fundamental uh, interest in understanding those things that cause certain people to get sick and die at a disproportionate rate and others that don't. And trying to solve that riddle. 
right? And as I completed my education, particularly in history and sociology, I learned that there are a lot of things that happen after we are born that are out of our control, like what zip code we're born into, the social determinants of health that affect our life expectancy and the quality of life while we're alive. And no one should get sick and die because of what zip code they're born, they're born into. And so I feel like I'm doing my small part. My team is, feels like they're doing their small part to um, bridge that gap and ultimately improve and save lives. So it's one of our pillars of Diamond Strategies, one of the areas that we work in the most, and that is in um, health and helping people understand health disparities, social determinants of health, and how to effectively serve an increasingly diverse um, patient uh, cohort that all of us are seeing. So I want to know some success stories, and um, we love celebrating that type of thing. So do you have any that you want to share with us um, that might have included some of your training workshops, some of your coaching efforts um, that has you know, helped lead to a, a more equitable and inclusive environment? Yes, I have a, a number of them, quite frankly. And one of the things that we love to do is celebrate victories, right? Because this is a distance run. It, it, it isn't a sprint. So we have to have celebrate victories to keep us going. I think one of the things most recently that I found out, one of the clients that we worked with, not in healthcare, but I, I believe this is relevant. We have been working with them um, in an elongated way. So we were hired to help them assess where they are, strategize, create a, a five-year um, strategic plan, help them implement it, and conduct training a long way along the way to help fertilize the garden, right? To make it ripe so that those seeds that we plant can grow and, and flower to the best of their ability. And one of the things that this client established as one of their desired goals is to increase the diversity of their workforce without any quotas, without anything like that. And we were able to do that. Um, and, and in the last year, we saw almost a 6% increase. And this is 6%, you might think, oh, that's not huge. It's huge when you consider the fact that there was no increase in the past 26 years before we started. So that's one of them. Another one is, uh, this is more specific to healthcare. I had a number of physicians who I worked with. I actually went to um, the hospital and observed how they work, particularly how they prep for surgery and conduct surgery. And I shared with them a story that I heard about how to make surgery more efficient. And um, they adopted it as well. They wanted to save time within the surgery room and they wanted to be more efficient doing it. And I told them, you know, I, I heard this story about these, these physicians who wanted to do this. And they had talked to all of the physicians and healthcare providers that they could think of, and they weren't coming up with any new ideas. And someone said, hey, why don't we take a look at these pit crews in Formula One? Because they're like a model of efficiency. That car comes in and they got they got to get it up and running just like that. And these physicians brought in some of these Formula One people. And they just sat in the surgery room, kind of the way that I did, and they watched, they took notes. And afterwards, the, the physicians and the nurses and the techs said, you know, what can we do better? And they said, hey, you can put these tools over here. You can arrange the, the way that you're standing in this way, right? You can do, you can play different music. Um, different music affects our moods and what have you, and whether we're moving quickly or slowly, whether we can focus and things of that nature. And they did all of these things. And there are a bunch of other things, maybe six or seven other things that they suggested to not think of. And they actually cut time off of the procedure. So there is a business case. And there is also a um, efficiency, productivity, and human case for um, Jedi, particularly within healthcare. And those are just two examples, but I got a bevy of them, uh, you know, a bevy of them. Well, that sounds like another good reason to have you back on the show. Where are healthcare leaders or leaders at any stage of management? Doesn't, doesn't have to be necessarily in this sector. Where are they making missteps with this conversation we're having today? There are several. 
Um, several positives too, but several. Number one, leaders have to be vested in this effort. They have to be passionate and consistent about it. And they have to be resilient. Why? Because there's going to be pushback. There's going to be bumps in the road. We're human beings. So we need to try new things. But in trying new things and interacting with new people in a transparent and authentic way, we're going to make mistakes. Some will be faux pas. Some will be, you know, major size 13, which is the size of my foot, you know, in, in, in our mouths type of thing. Right. We're going to make mistakes. So one of the things that we have to do is have leadership be able to provide air cover to allow for this growth because it's a distance run. It's going to take time. It's taken 400 years for us to get here in terms of the heteronormativity, the head of the uh, homogeneity we find in many of our institutions and the lack of awareness and innovation because of it. And we're not going to correct that overnight. It's going to take time. So leaders have to be vested. They have to be clear. They have to be present. Because attitude reflects leadership. If they are not, particularly managers, those those mid-level folks, right? Um, Because if they are not modeling, at the very least, passion and dedication, then you're going to be swimming upstream. It's going to be hard. That's number one. Number two, you can't have what I call champagne wishes and a Kool-Aid budget, Right. Uh, in order for this to work like any other institutional imperative, you want to be efficient with your with with money, with with allocations. But there has to be allocations. Right. This, this is not a missionary activity. Right. This is not um, some sort of feel good thing. It's an institutional pillar. And like most pillars, you have to have a plan. You have to be understand that it's iterative. You're going to have to adjust it along the way and you're going to have to invest in it. And I think some leaders struggle with that aspect of it. And I think the last thing is leaders cannot have divided duty because at some point along the way, this happens with every single client we work with. That's why I'm saying this. We haven't had an exception. There are those who understandably in some cases will ask or feel rather that this Jedi thing is just an effort to oust and marginalize white men and to prop up unqualified people of color and kowtow to people who just can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps or, you know, just sort of toughen up. And they will usually, and on average, that's about the the really stride in folks, about two to 3% of employee population. So it's not a a large group, but it's a power, it's it's an outspoken group. And a lot of times leadership will arrest what they want to do. They will stop it. They will put a pause They'll put a chill on it. They won't invest on it as much as they want to. They will temper their passions um, in part to make those folks happy. And I call that divided duty. What I suggest to leaders is your duty is towards the mission. And what will make your mission, what will animate your mission, your values, and your purpose, and make it effective? Jedi is indispensable to that. So if you really want to to model, be an exemplar for your mission, you have to invest in this. And you have to not dismiss those who have concerns. Because as I said, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's lots of apprehension, lots of angst. And leaders have to be able to explain why this is important and be firm in the direction that they're sailing the ship. Because I have seen cases where, um, you know, that, that children's book, give a mouse a cookie. I've seen where leaders have given a mouse a cookie and the mice have wanted a big glass of milk, meaning no Jedi at all. And it's just sort of arrested the effort. So those are the three things um, that that I see. But I will add this. The way that we work with folks, we haven't had a lot of that. Um, Some clients more than others. But in general, we haven't had a lot of it because we don't approach we don't approach approach this as some drudgery. You know, as you go into it all forlorn and we don't point fingers at folks and personalize it because that's not going to get anybody anywhere. We're going to have to get there together. So we try to approach it with some humor 
I have some anecdote and stories. I'm a historian. We tell stories and um, try to draw people in because we are either all going to get there together or we're not going to get there at all. What is it that Martin Luther King said? And I'll stop when he said that we, we are all going to uh, work together as brothers and sisters or perish as fools. And I firmly believe that that's true. This has been great. Um, give a moose a muffin is my I'm partial to that one. That's yeah, my son's. That's yeah. right. I think oh it's God, along the that. same idea. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts, Dr. Whitaker, before we wrap it up here? Is there anything else you wanted to add? This has been an unbelievable discussion. Um, so I'll give you the final word if there was anything else you wanted to. to yeah, I'll just quickly say, yeah, for, thank you for anybody who's listening to not be riddled with anxiety when they think about Jedi. It doesn't have to be a highly politicized thing. Because in the end, it will help us serve the folks that we want to serve. It'll help, particularly in the healthcare arena, it will help um, folks be well, and it will help serve lives, and it will help um, those who are serving our <laughs> overworked and overextended healthcare providers. It will help them maximize their potential and understand their strengths, their opportunities for growth, and how to you know, maximize their passion, skills, and talents. So I would just suggest folks, hey, um, if you've had some sort of ambiguity um, coursing through your veins when, when looking at and evaluating Jedi and trying to understand it or some apprehension that um, it doesn't necessarily have to be some scary thing. And a lot of that depends upon who you're working with, right? Um, we have a passion for this. We've been, our team, most of my team has been doing it long before they had my college education. I led my first training when we called it multiculturalism when I was in high school. That was a long time ago. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to bring people together and try to advance uh, unity. That's what I would say to people. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Dr. Matthew Whitaker. He's recently joined the faculty coaching team here at the Healthcare Experience Foundation. He is the chief executive officer of Diamond Strategies, LLC. He's an author, historian, Cornell University Certified DEI Executive, Community Outreach Specialist, and an interest-based resolution practitioner. Dr. Whitaker, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Casey. My pleasure.